Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's. If you're visiting, you're especially welcome. And if you'd like us to be in touch with you, you could fill out one of the visitor cards in the pew pocket in front of you and drop it on the offering plate. And we'll get in touch in the next week or so. Uh, several, of, several of us aren't here this week. There's a women's retreat at St. Andrew's Conference Center uh, on the Hood Canal. So I hear reports that it's going very well. Uh, and we've got a men's retreat coming up uh, at the end of April, and if you want more information about that, there's registration forms uh, in the back in the narthex. This is also the last Sunday of Lent, which means next Sunday is Palm Sunday, uh, which begins Holy Week, so there's always a lot of things going on during Holy Week, some of which you should sign up for. The first is Maundy Thursday is going to be a service over the course of a meal, so if you would sign up for the meal, it just helps us know how many to prepare for. You could do that in the back or online. Uh, and then following that service, we have a prayer vigil that goes all night long uh, in the narthex, uh, and it's a time to spiritually prepare yourself and to kind of be with Jesus as he is uh, in the garden en route to the cross. Uh, we encourage you to sign up in pairs. One, it just gives you someone else to pray with, even if it's silently by, by each other. But also, if you're here at 3 in the morning, it's nice not to be here alone. Uh, even if it's a church, it can still be kind of freaky to be in the church in the dark. So uh, <laughs> you can sign up for that in the back as well. Um, and then we're having an Easter brunch. It says there's a sign up, but I didn't see one, but it's a potluck. So just come to church with something to share. And that'll be after the 10 o'clock service on Easter. And there's uh, things for kids going on that time as well. Are there any birthdays or anniversaries we could remember this morning? Okay. I'm kind of here by proxy. It is uh, my 11th mom anniversary. Miriam turned 11 on the 21st, but she's homesick today. Lord, we thank you for Miriam's birth. And we thank you that you have always been with her. And we ask your special blessing on her this year, that she would continue to grow into the woman you have made her to be in your image. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. the Lord who forgives all our sins. Mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all our open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Send the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophecy to these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he had commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. And then he said to me, <clears throat> Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from the graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Paul to the Romans. 
To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now there was a certain man, Lazarus of Bethany, who was ill, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? 
Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying there. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Throughout this season of Lent, we've been paying particular attention to the general confession, that bit of the liturgy we pray every week, year after year. And I remember being new to the Episcopal way of worship, and the confession was one of the elements I found so attractive about the liturgy. This weekly invitation to pause and take stock, scan my memories of the week, and to simply name my failings and shortcomings before God and to know that everyone else in the church was doing the exact same thing. There was no need to pretend, to put on airs that we were better Christians than we actually were. Now, like you, rarely am I confessing some major sin by societal standards. I, I've never had to confess to murdering someone or stealing something. Generally speaking, I'm a decent, upright citizen, and every week, there's much I need to confess because I'm a sinner, like you, uh, because I get cranky and tired and I could only see the world through my own narrow, misinformed way because I'm self-centered and prone to fear. Most of the sins I confess every week have to do with how I've treated the people closest to me, my family, my coworkers, you. <laughs> I'm grateful how the liturgy is a sacred space that invites me safely each week to be honest before God, and every week to hear God saying, I know, I know, and I forgive you again, and again, and again. And in the form of the confession we've been praying this scene, season, there's one line that stands out distinctly that doesn't show up in the other confession we use, and this is it. We repent of the evil done on our behalf. This is a big one. It taps into such a vast pit of systemic sin in which we are complicit, and often totally unaware, often without any means to correct. So how on earth are we supposed to repent if by repent we mean to turn away and to walk in a new, holy, Christ-like way? Simply by nature of being human, of being part of this physical and social world, it is impossible for us not to be complicit in any number of systems that are broken, that cause suffering, and often benefit us in some way. And by virtue of being first world people, there are a disproportionate number of systems that benefit us. And the higher we rank on the social scale, the greater our complicity is in this web of broken systems done on our behalf. What privilege we have to go to the store with its aisles and aisles of fresh food, frozen food, packaged food, with hardly any conception at all of what was required to get there, of ecosystems destroyed to plant an efficient monoculture, of the carbon footprint to get us blueberries in winter, blueberries covered with pesticides, blueberries packaged in plastic that will never go away, but just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces polluting the furthest reaches of the planet. Blueberries tended and harvested by people living in horrendous circumstances who are themselves often scapegoated in their host countries as if they were the real problem. How many sins were committed on our behalf so we could enjoy fresh blueberries in our morning smoothies 
as we follow the doctor's orders to eat them because they're good for us. When I was newly married and Henry was a baby, I was unemployed for six months, and it was awful. <laughs> the shame, the stress, and finally I got a job in a florist. Now, granted, selling flowers is a somewhat frivolous industry, but it's how my family survived for five years, and I was grateful for the work and still am. And in our culture, flowers are one of the ways we celebrate and communicate the major events in our life. Flowers for weddings, flowers for funerals, flowers for babies born and boyfriends saying I'm sorry when they screw up, flowers to beautify our home with God's beauty. And in order to have fresh flowers, underpaid workers in chemical-filled Colombian greenhouses are stooped over carrying this burden of our life's celebrations. And I imagine, just like me, they're grateful for the work. The point is this. It is so complex how many good things, worthwhile things, honorable things, and holy things are so intermingled with sinful things and evil things done on our behalf. I remember walking once through an upscale neighborhood in Johannesburg shortly after the fall of apartheid. The political situation might have changed, but the societal system was still highly stratified. And I remember beyond the 10-foot walls mounted with security cameras, just how beautiful the gardens were. And I remember thinking, of course they want to keep it this way. I could just imagine happy little children running out of their beautiful homes, across the verandas, jumping into their pools, laughing and playing while their nannies kept their watch, while their cooks prepared their healthy lunch. Of course they want to keep it this way. And all the while, these innocent little children are utterly oblivious to what was required to support and sustain their pleasant life, oblivious to the sins committed on their behalf. Now, of course, apartheid was an extreme condition, but it existed on a social and economic continuum on which we all live. Our circumstances may be less exaggerated, but simply by virtue of being Americans, of being white, of being a male, of being educated, of having health insurance, we are all in our way like those children in the swimming pool, oblivious to the complex system sustained on our behalf, sins committed for our safety and our comfort. To say nothing about wars waged on our behalf, whether we supported the war or not, tax policies structured on our behalf, education systems bent towards our behalf, such that regardless of whatever, whatever purity we espouse in our politics, our ethics, our theology, we are complicit in a myriad of sins committed on our behalf. And not only is it true on the macro-systemic level, it occurs as well on a smaller scale within the sphere of our relationships. And this is when I see it happening. When we step into a situation that does not require our participation in order to defend or promote or uplift someone else, and we do it in a harmful way. I remember years ago, I lived in an ecumenical Christian community that was also a retreat house for people seeking spiritual renewal. There was another member of this community, Brona, who was Catholic, and I had a crush on her. And at one point, this Protestant guy came to stay in our guest house, and when he met Brona, he took it upon himself to convert her. And I, trying to be brazen and chivalrous, took it upon myself to defend and protect her. Of course, the real issue driving me was my ego and my insecurity as a potential suitor. Brona didn't need me to protect her. She knew how to handle well-intentioned Protestants. <laughs> and this guest, who'd come to us for spiritual renewal, ended up leaving early because of the aggression and inhospitality he experienced from me, the host. It was a sin committed on Brona's behalf. How often do we justify our bad behavior because of such supposed gallantry? How we mock and demean public figures in the name of political righteousness, as if righteousness ever required the buttress of our sin. 
how we gossip and enjoy complaining about an in-law and supposed fealty to a family member when all they need from us is our love. And how often such sins are waged for us. Now, I know this is a gloomy sermon, but it is the fifth week of Lent. (laughs) And it still begs the question, what exactly are we praying when we repent of the evil done on our behalf? If repenting means more than saying I'm sorry, but is instead a pledge to change the way we are living. Well, the standard advice applies. Keep educating yourselves to understand beneath the rhetoric the complex realities of our social and economic systems, to hear the stories of those who suffer in order to bring us pleasant things, where you do have privilege or influence to use it on behalf of those who have no power, to live a more modest lifestyle, consuming less and blessing more. All of this is responsible behavior. It does reflect a true movement of repentance in our desire to live more like Christ to this world. And there's a reason we repeat the same confession every week. Because even as we attempt to do better, we remain entangled by so much sin and evil, including that done on our behalf. Such is the world in which we live. We are as that valley of dry bones, the remnants of battles fought, picked over by vultures and bleached in the sun. We are as Lazarus in the tomb, smelling of rot after four days, knotted in a web of grave clothes. And we live in hope that the God before whom we repent, the God who forgives us again and again, will meet us and this whole creation in our brokenness, will greet us in love, and in the face of such despair and wickedness, yet cry out, take away the stone. Lazarus, come out unbind him and let him go for this is the base of our hope this is the substance of our prayers week after week that evil and sin will not have the final word but that final word shall be love and that love shall set us free amen stand and share our hope in God's redeeming through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate 
he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. From a posture that suits you, let us incline our hearts and wills in prayer to God, who awakens us and unbinds us from the grip of sin and death. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for the church. We pray for St. John's, for the Diocese of Olympia, and the church around the world, and for its leaders and ministers. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill your church with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for justice and peace. We pray for Gig Harbor, for our nation and for the nations of the world and for all leaders and public servants. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill the nations with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for those who are vulnerable and oppressed. We pray for all who suffer and for all who are called to minister and protect them. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill your precious ones with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for the world you have created. We pray for the land, the air, the seas, and for every living thing, and for all who steward your creation. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill the world with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for our families and companions. We pray you give healing and comfort, strength and courage, and wisdom and grace to those in our hearts and to us who walk with them. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill our beloved with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for those who have requested our prayers, for members of St. John's living with chronic illness, Joan Hansen, Jerry Violet, John Hayes, J.T. Bottom, Carol Hughes, Bev Moore, Jan Garrigan, Mike Brokaw, and Margaret Bozich. For parishioners who have asked for prayers, Ken and Ginger Barons, Debbie Smith, Christy Laybourne Neal, Susan Hayes, Annabella Brock, Andrea Backland, Hank Adams, Barb Carr, Pat Frasino, Lloyd Filkins, and Stu Adams. For our family members and friends, the Van Doren family, George and Lisa Nowak, Vienna, Glenn Bartholomew, Brian, Lynn, Leanna Emerson, the Richter family, Ren Dudley, the Filkins family, and Jerry and Bob Maynard. For whom else shall we pray? Roger, Joan, Surround them with your love and bless those who care for them. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill our companions with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our longing for those who have died. 
We pray especially for Monty Gray, father of Elizabeth Gray. Give them eternal life and your promised comfort to those who grieve. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill the departed with your goodness. God of all mercy, we confess our delight in all the blessings you have given us. Grant that we may use them to your glory and that our lives reflect your praise. Speak your renewing and transforming word. Fill our hearts with your goodness. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Welcome again to St. John's and welcome to the altar of Christ. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, you were created and have their being. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us, Therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory and their unending hymn. Holy, holy. So, Father, we have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit. Now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you 
and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, strengthen you with hope and courage and love. Amen.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.